who lived and died in grace have found their heart's desire gaze upon the Savior's face sing, sing, oh heavenly choir sing all you angels gathered round the throne of God most high sing with the saints and all created things to praise the Lord of life Welcome to Drama Kirk's Bible Study Evening, where we use drama to get to know Bible characters and therefore our Bible a wee bit better. I'm Liz Blackman and as ever I'm grateful to everyone who's been involved in making this happen for you tonight. That includes those that you will see performing as well as those who have worked so hard behind the scenes. Now if you are watching this live, that's Tuesday the 27th of October at 7pm, you can use the chat functionality on YouTube to interact with us. You can find the chat panel to the right hand side of the main screen. Just a wee reminder, if you have clicked full screen to view this, you will need to unclick that anytime you want to be able to use or view the chat. We have three pauses for reflection planned in our study tonight, which will help us use that. However, you can, of course, ask any questions or make any observations at any time throughout the study. We will be there and we we'll look forward to hearing from you. Tonight, we continue looking at the messianic prophecies in the run-up to Christmas. Last time, we focused on Isaiah, the first of the major Old Testament prophets. Now, Isaiah had much to tell us about the coming of Jesus. And his prophecies were confirmed by his contemporaries and the prophets who came later. What we won't do tonight is go over that same ground. Instead, we will try to look at what the other prophets additionally told us about Jesus. Derek has kindly agreed to open in prayer for us tonight. Derek. Let us pray. God of justice and mercy, we thank you for sending Jesus to be born at Bethlehem, as was prophesied by your servant Micah. In his crucifixion, we're grateful that he took upon himself the punishment for all that we have done wrong. The brutality and the scorn that was placed on his shoulders was because of our sin. How sorry we are that it has taken the cruel death of your beloved, precious Son to open our eyes to the waywardness of our lives. And so, Lord, as you offer to us a message of peace and mercy wrapped up in humility, the Bethlehem babe, may we also become peacemakers. And in doing so, Help us to show that we are your children. For the sake of Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Derek. Now, our format tonight will include Bible readings as well as a series of scenes and monologues which will help us picture what was going on, as well as a wee flight of fancy that we're going to share with you. We're going to start by exploring Jeremiah. You might have noticed in the opening slides a tongue-in-cheek quote which said, Jeremiah was without doubt the most depressed man in the Bible. So I thought we might start tonight by exploring why that might have been. In Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 18, he tells us this, My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. Perhaps 
During this year, like no other, you've had your own Jeremiah days. I'm sure few of us have felt immune from feeling like our joy has gone. Later in the same chapter, in verse 20, Jeremiah tells us this. Harvest is past. Summer is gone. But we ourselves haven't found deliverance. In Jeremiah for Everyone, John Golden Gay has this to say about those verses. Given that summer and harvest mark the end of the year, this saying about them resembles a gloomy comment we might make at the end of a year when nothing seems to have gone right or we seem to have accomplished nothing. Sound familiar? Have we felt like that about 2020, even at times? The year when the plans that we and our loved ones might have made have been thwarted, time and again. The year when the things we've so looked forward to just haven't come to fruition. Many months on, do we feel like we haven't found deliverance? How easy it would be to let those words echo our own gloom. How easy not to see the hope before us. However, perhaps unlike me, Jeremiah chapters 8 and 9 present us with a man who's not crying for himself. He's crying for his country, for God's people. Let's hear from the man himself in a dramatisation of those chapters taken from Dramatised Bible Readings for Festivals by Michael Perry. Jeremiah. My heart has been crushed because my people are crushed. I mourn. I am utterly dismayed. Is there no medicine in Gilead? Are there no doctors there? Why then, why have my people not been healed? Oh, I wish my head were like a well of water and my eyes like fountains of tears so that I might cry day and night for my people who've been killed. I wish I had a place to stay in the desert, a place where I could hide away from my people. They are all unfaithful, a mob of traitors. They are always ready to tell lies. Dishonesty instead of truth rules the land. My people do one evil thing after another and do not acknowledge me as their God. Everyone must be on guard against his friends and no one can trust his brother. For every brother is as dishonest as Jacob. And everyone slanders his friends. They are all misleading their friends and no one tells the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie. They will not give up their sinning. They do one violent thing after another and one deceitful act follows another. Did you notice he wished for tears to cry, not for himself, but for his nation? Throughout his ministry, Jeremiah experienced many hardships. His friends and family plotted against him. His prophecies were largely ignored or ridiculed. He even faced imprisonment. It's notable that no matter how bad the situation Jeremiah finds himself in, God still talks through him and to him. Let's drop in on him again. In chapter 33, we find our prophet in prison. God speaks to him there about the coming king. Let's hear that passage now from the dramatised Good News. While I was in prison, in the palace courtyard, the Lord's messenger came to me again. The Lord who made the earth, who formed it, who set it in place, spoke to me. The time is coming when I will fulfill the promise that I made to the people of Israel and Judah. At that time, I will choose as king a righteous descendant of David. 
that king will do what is right and just throughout the land. The people of Judah and of Jerusalem will be rescued and will live in safety. The city will be called the Lord our salvation. I, the Lord, promise that there will always be a descendant of David to be king of Israel and that there will always be priests from the tribe of Levi to serve me and to offer burnt offerings, grain offerings and sacrifices. The Lord said to me, I have made a covenant with the day and with the night so that they always come at their proper times and that covenant can never be broken. In the same way, I have made a covenant with my servant David that he would always have a descendant to be king. And I have made a covenant with the priests from the tribe of Levi that they would always serve me. And those covenants can never be broken. I will choose one of David's descendants to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I will be merciful to my people and make them prosperous again. God moves in a mysterious way His wonders to perform He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his song. Take courage now, you fearful saints. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. And I will trust. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust Him for His grace. Behind the frowning providence, He hides. Moving to Ezekiel now, a horse of a very different colour. Now, Ezekiel was a contemporary of Jeremiah. Um, however, he was exiled ten years before Jerusalem fell. So he was in a different place. And, and whilst we hear that Jeremiah was called to serve before he was even born, for Ezekiel that happens when already in exile. Um, he's thought to be about 30. In this, Ezekiel becomes God's prophet to the exiles. Proof, if they needed it, that God's people are never forsaken and still loved, even in exile. Now, let's see this colourful character now as he's called to God's service from the dramatised good news. Can I ask you to notice the beautiful language that's used here to describe all that Ezekiel sees, all that happens, and all that lies ahead of him? On the fifth day of the fourth month of the 30th year, I, Ezekiel the priest, son of Buzi, was living with the Jewish exiles by the river Shebar in Babylonia. The sky opened and I saw a vision of God. There was something that looked like a throne made of sapphire and sitting on the throne was a figure that looked like a man. The figure seemed to be shining 
like bronze in the middle of a fire. It shone all over with a bright light that had in it all the colours of the rainbow. This was the dazzling light that shows the presence of the Lord. When I saw this, I fell face downwards on the ground. Mortal man, stand up. I want to talk to you. While the voice was speaking, God's spirit entered me and raised me to my feet. And I heard the voice continue. Mortal man, I am sending you to the people of Israel. They have rebelled and turned against me and are still rebels, just as their ancestors were. They are stubborn and do not respect me. So I am sending you to tell them what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying to them. Whether those rebels listen to you or not, they will know that a prophet has been among them. But you, mortal man, must not be afraid of them or of anything they say. They will defy and despise you. It will be like living among scorpions. Still, don't be afraid of those rebels or of anything they say. You will tell them whatever I tell you to say, whether they listen or not. Mortal man, listen to what I tell you. Don't be rebellious like them. Open your mouth and eat what I am going to give you. I saw a hand stretched out towards me, and it was holding a scroll. The hand unrolled the scroll, and I saw there was written on both sides, cries of grief were written, and wails and groans. Mortal man, eat this scroll, then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Mortal man, eat this scroll that I give you. Fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey. Mortal man, go to the people of Israel and say to them whatever I tell you to say. I am not sending you to a nation that speaks a difficult foreign language. But to the Israelites, if I sent you to great nations that spoke difficult languages you didn't understand, they would listen to you. But none of the people of Israel would be willing to listen. They will not even listen to me. All of them are stubborn and defiant. Now I will make you as stubborn and as tough as they are. I will make you as firm as a rock, as hard as a diamond. Don't be afraid of those rebels. Mortal man, pay close attention and remember everything I tell you. Then go to your countrymen who are in exile and tell them what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying to them, whether they pay attention to you or not. Then God's spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me the wings of the creatures beating together in the air and the noise of the wheels as loud as an earthquake. The power of the Lord came on me with great force, and as his spirit carried me off, I felt bitter and angry. So I came to Tel Abib beside the river Shebar, where the exiles were living, and for seven days I stayed there overcome by what I had seen and heard. Something from the major prophets that we see strongly reflected in the New Testament is that concept of Jesus as our good shepherd, something that comes out very clearly in Ezekiel chapter 34. Now in Isaiah and Jeremiah, we hear lots of facts about the Messiah, whose line he will come from, that, what he will do, that sort of thing. In Ezekiel, we hear a little more about the character of Jesus, more about who he will be rather than what he will be, if you like. We're going to hear from our heavenly host now as we hear Ezekiel chapter 34 from the dramatised Good News. This was going to be followed by our second pause for reflection as we have an opportunity to share what we hear in this passage about the character 
of Jesus. I, the Sovereign Lord, tell you that I myself will look for my sheep and take care of them as a shepherd takes care of his sheep when they were scattered and brought back at home again. I will bring them back from all the places where they scattered on that dark, disastrous day. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will find them a place to rest. I will look for those that are lost. I will bring back those that have wandered away, bandage those that are hurt, heal those that are sick. Now then, my flock, I, the Sovereign Lord, tell you that I will judge each of you and separate the good from the bad, the sheep from the goats. Some of you are not satisfied with eating the best grass. You even trample down what you do not eat. You drink the clear water and then muddy what you don't drink. My other sheep have to eat the grass you trample down and drink the water you muddy. So now, I, the Sovereign Lord, tell you that I will judge between the strong sheep and the weak ones. You push the sick ones aside and butt them away from the flock. But I will rescue my sheep and not let them be ill-treated anymore. I will judge each of my sheep and separate the good and the bad. I will give them a king, like my servant David, to be their one shepherd who will look after them. I will make a covenant with them that will guarantee their security. I will get rid of all the dangerous animals in the land so that my sheep may live safely in the field and sleep in the forest. I will bless them and let them live round my sacred hill. I will bless them with showers of rain when they need it. The trees will bear fruit. The fields will produce crops. Everyone will live safely in his own land. I will set them free from the chains that, that bound them, and then they will know that I am their Lord. I will give them fertile fields and put an end to hunger in the land. The other nations will not sneer at them anymore. Everyone will know that I protect Israel and that they are my people. The Sovereign Lord says, You, my sheep, the flock whom I feed, are my people, and I am your God. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will my ways in righteousness and he anoints my head with oil and my cup it overflows with joy I feast on his pure delights and I 
So, we have now considered our three major prophets. We know the prophecies for a better future that God's people were relying on in the first century. We've also met three very different men called to serve in different ways. Jack Miles, author of God, the biography, has this to say on them. The three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, may be considered respectively the manic, the depressive, and the psychotic articulation of the prophetic message. As for calm, sane, moderate visions of prophecy, in effect, there are none. When I read that quote in preparation for this study, it got me thinking, what might a group therapy session have looked like for these prophets? So, with my thanks to the Drama Kirk team for improvising that for you, we're going to share that group therapy session with you now. Welcome to group therapy, everyone. I know it's not easy being a prophet in these centuries. Let's take some time now, shall we, to uh, express what's on our minds and receive support from one another as we discuss our experiences together. My name's Jo, I'm your therapist for this evening. So we'll do an hour session, all discussing things that are of perhaps mutual concern and sharing experiences and learning from one another and perhaps receiving support for, for the very difficult job of being a prophet. Who am I going to learn from here? I mean, come on. What will you learn? You're looking at a guy who spent time in prison being ignored and being vilified by his own people. How does that go? I mean, you deserve it if you weren't so boring, man. I mean, come on. Bo boring, boring. Well, let's you see what these eggs are. What's the jump in the river? Can I, can I interrupt now? Let's, um, let's be respectful of one another. Um, does, any, does that experience of imprisonment and exile, does that resonate with anybody else in the group? Well, I share the sense of imprisonment because when I'm out, I feel that my society is godless. And I'm a prophet of God, and I feel like I am the only one there. I'm feeling really depressed now. This is not helping me. This is really not helping me. And the I thought think of Isaiah, with all due respect, without his prophetic robes, not a happy place for me. To be honest with you, Joe, and again, in fairness to all my friends, the prophets, major and minor. Thank you. I'm Micah, and I am one of the prophets too, considered a minor prophet, but we should be all considered equal. We've all got a story, we've all got things we can share, but please, let's be respectful to each other. So it's oh, nice get, to We get to be prophets to everyone, not just the minors. Well, I was going to say, I have to say, you know, major, minor, can I just say, Micah, with all due respect, it's not easy being a major prophet. Can we, can I interrupt a moment? We haven't heard um, very much from some of the other people in the group. Malachi, is there anything you'd like to share tonight? Lead me till the last. You'll have noticed that as well as our major prophets, we had a couple of the minor prophets join there for the therapy session, Micah and Malachi. We're going to have a short look at them now. Now, thanks to Micah, even Herod was told that the baby would be born in Bethlehem. In modern day nativities, we see this played out as Herod's only motivation in fearing the promised Messiah is a political coup. He doesn't want to let go of his power. However, perhaps there's more to it than that. Let's turn to Malachi chapter 3, verse 2, which says this. Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire 
and like Fuller's soap. In cover to cover, Abby Guinness has this to say about those verses. If this scripture had been used to talk about the coming Messiah, a refiner's fire, a fuller soap, then no wonder Herod and all of Jerusalem were scared. A fuller is someone who removes oil, dirt and impurities from wool. And the process involves stretching, beating and scouring. Being cleansed doesn't sound like a fun process. And Malachi asks, who will be able to endure it? Sticking with Abby Guinness now, let's hear a reflection on that passage of scripture from a New Testament character, Simeon. Ah, I long to give an offering to the Lord that pleases him. Presenting an offering in righteousness has been my life's goal. I haven't figured out a way to put myself in a fire and come out cleaner. It may work for silver and gold, but I would be charred at best. The only way will be by the Anointed One. How will he do it? I don't know exactly. He'll make an offering, a sacrifice, more holy than we are able to make. A perfect one. He will know how. I am longing for him to come, and yet I fear because I know he will. It will be such joy when he arrives, for he will help us turn to God. But judgment will be far from celebratory. How can we escape because none are sinless? We cling to the promise that our returning is mutual. God will return to us as we return to him. Purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold, pure gold. Refiner's fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be In this short series, we've met some very different prophets and saw their passion for sharing what God has given them. I'm going to hand over to Micah, Isaiah and Jeremiah now to tie things together. This is a scene from dramatised Bible readings from the NIV and it brings these prophets together to summarise beautifully their exciting messianic prophecies. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, 
whose origins are from old, from ancient times. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Fruit will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge. And of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. Thank you for joining us tonight, and my thanks, of course, to everyone who's been involved. I hope that what you've seen has helped you picture the characteristics of these prophets and what they told us about the Messiah's coming. Please do keep in touch. You can look for Drama Kirk on Twitter or Facebook, or you can email info at dramakirk.org. Some news about Drama Kirk's nativity now. We're planning to film a short nativity, Jerusalem News by Ray Markham, and that will be available for use by schools and churches. It's, it's geared for primary school age children. So if that's something that you would be interested in sharing with your local community, then please do get in touch. We are happy to share that resource with you. Our next Bible study evening like this will be at the start of Advent and we will feature Jerusalem News, which references a number of Bible characters. And in the study, we will then look into the backstory of those Bible characters and get to know them a wee bit better too. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have been blessed by what the prophets have shared with us tonight. And may we have some of that fire, hope and zeal in our hearts today. Shining star, come and guide our hearts. Shine. Welcome to group therapy, everyone. I know it's not easy being a prophet in these centuries. Let's take some time now, shall we, to uh, express what's on our minds and receive support from one another as we discuss our experiences together. Who would like to start the conversation tonight? I would. Oh, I go no, ahead, Jeremiah. To tears. Really? Oh, come on. I said two words, Ezekiel, and already you're in bumping your gums. Can I ask, firstly, who are you? My name's Jo. I'm your therapist for this evening. So we'll do an hour session all discussing things that are of 
perhaps mutual concern and sharing experiences and learning from one another and perhaps receiving support for, for the very difficult job of being a prophet. Who am I going to learn from here? I mean, come on. What will you learn from here? Oh, I'll learn. Oh, you could I've got God yakking in my head every day. Every day. Constant he's in there. I would have thought that was a good thing, Ezekiel. As far as what are you going to learn, you might learn something if you button it and listen to some of the problems I've had to deal with in my prophetic life. Which you to have to cut your dinner over cow dung. I mean, no, cow dung. Most Ezekiel, people get a fire. I've got to use cow dung. Can I just ask Ezekiel, what on earth are you eating if you're cooking it over cow dung? I've got no choice. Whatever's here. Remember, I don't have this cushy life in Jerusalem, you know. Cushy life. I've been living in the banks of this river thing for years with these exiles. I have dreamt of living on the banks of a river with exiles. You're looking at a guy who spent time in prison being ignored and being vilified by his own people. How does that go? I mean, you deserve it if you weren't so boring, man. I mean, come on. Bo boring. Boring. Well, let's You'd see make these exiles want to jump in the river. Can I can I interrupt now? Let's um let's be respectful of one another. Um does any does that experience of imprisonment and exile does that resonate with anybody else in the group? I, can I just say, Joe, if I may, I hope I, you don't mind me calling you, Joe, but I feel like I've known you for a while. You seem like a, 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 a decent person. I'm feeling a bit like I'm in prison now, having to listen to what this idiot Ezekiel says. Oh, for goodness sake. Life, because he once had to cook hey, something over cow dung. Please, please, everyone, please, can we just be respectful and listen to each other's stories? It's well, such an honour to be here and hear them. Why are we using language like we're using? So, sorry to interrupt whoever you are, but can I just ask, who are you? I'm Micah, and I am one of the prophets too. Considered a minor prophet, but we should be all considered equal. We've all got a story, we've all got things we can share, but please, let's be respectful to each other. So it's nice get, to we get to be prophets to everyone, not just the minors. Well, I was going to say, I have to say, you know, major, minor, can I just say, Michael, with all due respect, it's not easy being a major prophet. And I don't know if you've uh, some kind of self-appointed kind of prophet equality ambassador. I don't kind of know if that's where you're coming from. But really, to be honest with you, until you've experienced the trials of the major prophets, with all due respect, Micah, you might want to just maybe tone it down a little bit. Because maybe listening to Ezekiel, to me, providing Ezekiel just doesn't keep going back to his cookery classes, you might learn something. Well, do you know what? I, take, I do take that on board. I just wish we could all be respectful, but I certainly take on board what you're saying, Jeremiah. Don't Thank let you. him bully you. He's a depressive. If you think, let him talk to you, you'll put you to sleep. Depressive. That's why he keeps getting put in jail. He's, he's chronic. There's nothing chronic about me, Ezekiel, other than the chronic ringing in my ears every time you open your mouth and oh, start... please, everyone. That's chronic. Uh, at least we think there's a righteous man among us. A I'm righteous just... man. You know, the, the, the path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the iniquities of the selfish like yourself and the tyranny of evil men. That's a lot of big words for you, Ezekiel. Very impressive. Very and impressive. in sentences too. I'm very impressed. I dare say you'd be writing in paragraphs if you were writing it down. Really, you, I'm really impressed by that, Ezekiel. Uh, well done. Uh, can we, can I interrupt a moment? We haven't heard um, very much from some of the other people in the group. Isaiah, how are things for you at the moment? Well, I share the sense of imprisonment because when I'm out, I feel that my society is godless and I'm a prophet of God and I feel like I am the only one there that's probably because you get your clothes off my clothes are on oh, after a change oh, wow. I dress for the occasion tonight I'm feeling really depressed now this is not helping me this is really not helping me and with, I think all Isaiah, with all due respect without his prophetic robes not a happy place for me to be honest with you, Joe, and again, in fairness to all my friends, the prophets, major and minor. Thank you. You know, every time they interrupt what I'm trying to tell you, I feel in some way belittled. It's no wonder I'm so depressed. I have no wife. I have no children. Nobody 
to listen to me, Joe, nobody to take me seriously. I spent so much time in prison. My own people hate me. None of the other prophets really know how that feels. Really? Exile for over 30 years. Exile. I don't even get to live in Jerusalem, which is probably a good job because the place is getting burnt to the ground soon. All these people coming in to take. But you, but your cushy life, but you don't treat them right, and that's why you don't have a wife. No woman would be daft enough to have you. I think that's very unfair, Ezekiel. And to be frank, if I had a button right now that I could press and send you back into exile, that button I'd be pressing right now. Because you have okay, let me, let me just stop you there, Jeremiah, if you don't mind. Um, can we move the conversation on a bit? Malachi, is there anything you'd like to share tonight? Feed me till the last. No problem. Um, anybody else? Any Joe, can different I, experiences? I, hi, Joe. Sorry, ahead, I'm really Micah. very sorry for interrupting again, but I really would like it if we could listen to everybody's story. And can I thank you again? It really is. It's so great to be here. I'm very humbled that you've asked me to come along, but I think it would just be so important to listen to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Malachi. I want to hear the stories, but we need to listen and we need to remember we're equal. We've all got a, sh a story to share, but Joe, I know you'll be able to do that. Thank you for, for letting us talk to you. Well, I think you, you could be quite blessed you know, the charity and the goodwill that you're showing to people. You know, that, that, that's a blessing from God, even if you're not very important. Well, we're all important. We've all got a story to share. Come on, we all have. We know that. Well, Mike, well, You've had God you know. yakking in your head for 30 flaming years. You would know all about it. Well, well I, I take, that, I take well. that on board and I, you know, I, I sympathise. I do wish you a lot of health and happiness and prayers. Look, I, I think, I don't mean to cut across anyone, but I think we've got the big picture here. Mike is a minor prophet. He's just happy to be here. But I have to say, from my perspective, I want Joe to help me. I need help because my mood is not great. I have not had an easy time as a prophet. Um, Ezekiel once had to prepare dinner using cow dung. Big deal. I've been in prison and I have no company, no wife, no family. Joe, what, what could you recommend? How can you help me? Well, I've had great success on online dating, actually. Well, Joe, I have to say, that's not something I've tried so far, but um, maybe it's maybe that's where I've gone wrong. Maybe that is where I've gone wrong. Um, because uh, I've never felt able to, because I've been so devoted, frankly, to, to, to the work of God, unlike one or two others I could mention, major and minor. Is that that Tinder you're talking about? I'd like some Tinder, make my dinner taste nicer. Tinder's a different thing. Tinder's what you use to, to, to burn your cow dung. That's as close as you get to Tinder, my uh, friend. That's what I mean. Guys, we're at it again. That. That's Please, Tinder for you. <clears throat> Please listen. You're at, you keep going at each other, but we need to listen. We've all got reasons we're here, and Joe is really nicely and kindly helping us. Oi, Let's oi, listen. Oi, no, one prophet any more of this, I'm going to strike down on you with oh. great vengeance and furious anger. Who's going to strike down on me? You, the Lord. Can. The Lord okay. will strike down on you. Okay. He oh, really? He's always in my heat because he can't get into yours with all the boredom. Listen, I try to be optimistic, Joe. I try to be optimistic. So the other day, I was thinking, how can I be more optimistic about life? Because usually, usually I'm pretty down. But as I get older, Joe, as I get older, you know, so I'm grateful that we haven't had any earthquakes recently. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for that. That's a good thing. Um, I'm also grateful we've not had any bolts of lightning striking more recently. As I get older, Joe, to be honest, I've got serious issues with, with nasal hair. So much so that there's so much going on in my nose, Joe, that if we do have another lightning strike, the whole nose could go up like a tinder box to go back to Ezekiel. That's the most intelligent thing you've said ever. Well, and Joe, I don't mean to sound self-obsessed and, and depressed, but also, Joe, I'm losing my hair. As a prophet, I'm losing my hair. And you know how I know that, Joe? I know that because every day it's taking me longer to wash my face. You know, I hope I, when Nebuchadnezzar raises Jerusalem that he actually sets your hair on fire. There's not much what to work going to do with the rest of the city. I let's, mean, come uh, on, man. let's bring in... Could I interrupt? Let's bring in Malachi here because he might have something to say about hair loss as well. Joe, I hope no one takes our grapes from this. 
But I'm quite happy to leave the best till the last. Sour, sour okay. grapes. Okay. Sour grapes. Wait a minute. What are yours? Sour grapes is one of my is one of my prophetic phrases. I will be reporting Malachi, whoever he is, to the copyright board for profits because he's just used one of my phrases. We'll be hearing about the leopard changing his spots next. Mr. Malachi, Mr. I can't think of a thing to say myself, but I'm happy to pick your catchphrase. No wonder, no wonder that you've got no woman if you come out with that trite oh, nonsense. Please, leopard changes its spots. I think you're taking Joe's advice and trying the online dating. If Malachi believes they were leaving the best to last, we should listen, respect it, and hear his story. If that's what he thinks, that's why we're here. Come on, everybody. We're all equal. Major and minor. It's profits. That's the most important thing. I'm not sure about this equality thing. What do you think, Ezekiel? I, th I think he's talking nonsense. Yeah. Isaiah, what do you think? Oh, I can't I hear you, man. Isaiah, Isaiah, you're on mute. You're on mute. You're on you mute. press the button. I you. press it. I press it. Oh, oh. Why are we asking the opinion of this idiot? He, he's he's on mute. Well, I yeah, let's, um, you. let's not Let use God insulting language, mute. please. Thank you, Joe. Well, I, I must apologise to Isaiah for calling. Oh, he's an idiot. Sorry, Isaiah. I'd love to hear what Isaiah said, providing can find the unmute button. Sorry, Isaiah. I didn't find the mute button again. We're fine. I was going to agree with you. Major prophets. A lot more to say, a lot more to share in this group to allow the minor prophets to perhaps consider and become like us one day. That must be going to say, is to be like all, one of the three of us. Again, I would, I would totally respect that, but all I'm going to say is remember the information I provided about Bethlehem. It was so important. So please, we've all, we've all got something. But I do respect your opinion. I respect everybody's opinion. We've got to do that. Thank you for your gentle words, Micah. Malachi, what would you like to say at this point? I would like to say that there's an awful lot of bickering going on here, and I would like to agree with Micah. There needs to be a lot more respect. But again, leave the best to the last. Respect? For him? Mr. Depression? Oh, you're talking nonsense. Tell, tell me this, Ezekiel. Tell me this, because you've got a lot to say for yourself. Have right. you ever... All the time, God's in my head. He's talking. He's telling me. You see, one of the reasons you're probably as unpopular, uh, unpopular like me is because he keeps telling me to say bad things. Oh, you. Stop doing that. You're not righteous. You're going to get slain. You're going to get smited. What do you think? People see me coming and run away just because they think I'm going to tell them they're going to die. Well, I have to say, if I saw you, and I saw what you've done to your hair, Ezekiel, I think I'd be running away as well. Oh, At least I've got a woman. Got, Jeremiah, please, we've got to respect, like respect his hair. Lighting. His hair's fine, that's what he wants to do. <sighs> My hair's like this because you don't have combs out here in the wilderness. I'll comb you in a minute. Ezekiel, yeah. you keep this up, I'll tell you. I'll give you a comb. Just because oh, you've got sake. mere, just because you've got mere pages in the Bible, doesn't mean you're better than me. It's quality exactly. over really quantity, cool. my man. Quality over quantity. Well, I'm sure, Ezekiel, the three or four paragraphs you've got have changed a lot of lives, my friend. Unlike the chapter after chapter after chapter that I've got. No offence. That put people to sleep, at least when they read my wee bit. They get quality stuff that keeps them awake and they're concentrating because they need to follow what I say or they're going to get smited. Kind of, You're not way, threatening them with smiting. Mighty is not a word. You threaten them with going to sleep. But with the best will, the bit that I've got is the bit they read in the build up to Christmas, the build up for hope, the build up for the big Christian festival. So there's no doubt here who's got the best bit in the Bible. And it's you, either of you two win bags. It's you here. Oh, for you, goodness you sake, don't tell Joe, I'm the really sorry about, about the lack though. of respect. <laughs> Think of all these stories together. Think what they bring together. They lead up to Christmas, me telling you about Bethlehem. That's why we're all prophets. Prophets, remember, respect our story. You've answered my question, but don't talk over each other. I'm really sorry, Joe, for all of this. You're getting smited. Again, can I just say, not a word. If you were, Maybe if you did a bit more reading of Holy Scripture, you would be able to conjugate your verbs, big man. Smote. Oh, Smote it's like that, is it? Yeah. I can't conjugate my verbs. Well, listen, 